Okay, so um, moving back into the context of the Seljuks and the broader context of the Christian world, the Sultanate of Rum expands towards Constantinople. The Byzantine ruler appeals for help from the Christian West, launching the First Crusade, which we've um, covered. Uh, there's a loss of lands to Christians. Uh, later, um, a non-Seljuk Kurdish man named Salahuddin or Saladin uh, took Muslim lands back. And Seljuk Sultanate loses key, uh, a key battle um, eventually in 1202 to Georgia. Um, and so, uh, and, and by the way, this is again, we're covering, you know, little hallmarks over a, a point of time in terms of um, the history here. So anyways, um, in other words, I'm not having a lot of uh, details in between dates uh, that I'm having. Anyways, um, the Seljuk Sultanate loses its key battle in 1202 to Georgia. Okay, um, ruled by Tamar, known by the Georgian Orthodox Church as the Holy Righteous Queen uh, Tamar. And um, I don't know if you remember, Russia and Georgia was in, in the news in the past, just a similar way that Ukraine uh, um, was. Um, but again, while I've always argued there's not an inherent clash between the Islamic and the Christian world, there's definitely been a history of those clashes. And again, we're talking about uh, uh, now Turkic uh, and, and non-Arab Muslims uh, um, um, in this case. Okay, um, I'm just going to mention just briefly the Khazar Empire, the Jewish uh, later later um, to be considered a Jewish empire. So the Khazarian royalty and nobility, um, we are uh, uh, with, with very little historical documents, but documents nonetheless, is that the royal, uh, the nobility converted to Judaism in around the 8th or 9th century. And currently there's a lot of debates that scholars have to how much of the population was converted. Actually, there's a, uh, recently, an Israeli historian who's actually making the debate that this never even occurred at all, and that there's no proof for it. Um, he... I, I, I'm, I'm yet to be convinced, but I just wanted to point that out. Um, according to the standard view, it remained Jewish for 200, possibly up to 400 years. Um, now, according to the Israeli historian Shlom Wazan, he said, after the first half of the 13th century, there are no more mentions of Khazaria. The kingdom sank into historical oblivion. <coughs> um, a lot of that has to do with the Mong coming of the Mongols later. Um, and there was issues with uh, the Rus coming in as well. But I just kind of want to mention something on here that originally Jewish writers uh, uh, wanted to point out the idea of perhaps Ashkenazi Jews being Turkic. Me and, and the idea was is to fight anti-Semitism and saying we're not even necessarily Semitic. Um, and after all, Judaism is a religion, not an ethnicity. Um, and uh, I have a friend who's Jewish, and he said when he was uh, younger, his parents felt that if you said that being Jewish was an ethnicity, you were an anti-Semite. With the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, things have shifted to where many people see Jewish as, as an ethnicity and not inherently as a religion, uh, especially being that Israel has such a, uh, so many Israelis who don't claim to be religious um, <clears throat> and have a, a very fervent Israeli uh, or Jewish nationalism. Um, and, and so here's where it gets complicated. In the modern context, uh, if if Jews were of Turkic background, according to Shlomo Zan, the historian, why should he be insulted uh, about that if he finds out that that's um, his ethnic background, um, for example? Um, what if Judaism was simply a, a, a converting religion that drew in people uh, in the way that Christianity and Islam does? But where it complicates things is 
Israel claims a historic right to Palestine, and the Jews going there are claiming to return. It's called Aliyah, returning. If, let's say, Ashkenazi Jews were actually from a Turkic background, they're not returning to the land of Palestine. They may have never had, their relatives may have never stepped foot there, and it undermines the historic claim. And so this becomes a very hotly contested debate in Israeli politics. And for Palestinians, some, it's an easy thing to say, oh, look, you're Khazarian, you don't even belong here. So it gets really complicated in the current mix, and even anti-Semites have tried to claim that that uh, what makes the Jews so bad is that they're not even real Jews, they're fake, they're actually Turkic imposters. It gets ridiculous. I just think it's an interesting history. We don't need to um, draw in uh, crazy political uh, uh, um, punch punches here. But uh, since I'm covering the steppe peoples and Turkic peoples and their, and their variety, I think it's significant if, in fact, they were Jewish this long, regardless of how, how this spread into Europe, it's an interesting history. Unfortunately, a lot of sources are lost to the point where you can even get a scholar who debates the actual historicity of it at all. Um, but there are Jewish accounts from the times that definitely do state that there is this. So um, if you're interested, go feel free to explore the topic on your own. But okay, moving on. Um, so around 1206, Timujin. Uh, uh, proclaims to be Genghis Khan. He's the most significant out of all the, we're talking about uh, uh, the steppe peoples here that we all know. Um, he devastated uh, um, um, many empires uh, uh, and hit China. I mean, just look at the map here. Okay. And by the time he dies in 1227, his troops kill uh, millions. Um but he really puts Mongolia on the map and Mongolians in the map, all over the map. Um, and so we will end up, uh, uh, you'll end up watching the crash course discussing a little bit more about that as well. But um, he is highly significant. So keep in mind, the Mongols and the Turkic uh, uh, peoples are, are different but they're also very similar uh, 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 in many ways, and they're coming from the same area, okay? Um, so basically, Genghis Khan, uh, his, his conquests are four times the size of Alexander the Great's empire and twice that of, Ro of the Roman. Pretty huge, massive impact on the world, uh, no doubt, okay? So, um, you know, like Alexander the Great, are these good guys or bad guys? But mainly they were considered bad, but their legacies become more complicated. So the death and destruction that these rulers would enact, it's hard to try to morally say, you know, to justify. But then their legacy, as we'll see in the um, crash course, is a lot more uh, complicated. Okay, um, so just look at what eventually you're seeing here the spread of mongolian power and their uh, uh you know where they're going in the world is qu quite uh, um you know extensive um so let's talk a little bit about uh them in china so genghis khan's son ogade uh, elected uh, uh, was elected great Khan in 1229 and Ogade died in a drinking binge in 1241 by the way this happens a lot there's a lot of bravado with drinking and guess what drinking can kill especially when you're doing contests um, and uh, anyhow how his his successor was his nephew Kublai uh, uh, Khan after leading Mongol army, armies against China's Song dynasty in the 1250s uh, he attempted to take Japan and Southeast Asia um, and uh, didn't, wasn't able to do that. Um, and he ends up creating uh, his own uh, dynasty, which I'll get back to in the next uh, lecture.